Welcome back, everybody, to Fresh Outlook. Scores of onlookers are expected to gather today near a Georgia church for the funeral of Bobby Christina Brown, the only singer, only child, rather, of the late singer Whitney Houston. The 22-year-old died just days ago in hospice care, six months after suffering brain damage in a still unexplained incident at her home. She was reportedly found face down and unresponsive in a bathtub by her boyfriend. Meanwhile, that boyfriend, Nick Gordon, who was raised alongside her like a brother, is facing a $10 million lawsuit accusing him of causing those life-threatening injuries and stealing from her bank account while she was in a coma. Let's say hello to the Fresh Outlook Think Tank. I am joined by the great one, Dr. Bart Rossi, <laughs> political psychologist, I am also joined by parenting coach Stephen Lynn, a fatherhood expert from DeedsDrivenDads.com, and Tom Gagliano, a life coach and published author. Bart, I'll start with you. Um, a mother commits suicide in a horrible way. A child commits suicide in a horrible way. Suicide runs in families, right? Well, perhaps, but I, I, I think that there might be a tendency based on a lot of factors but uh, as you know I run an opiate addiction center in California with my daughter who's a psychologist and I can tell you that when it comes to drugs today though uh, especially Percocet, Vicodin, Oxycontin, move, moving into heroin people think that they can contain this they think they can control it they think they can deal with it and get high but you can't you end up losing and you lose big time and this family is, is a colossal uh, demonstration of what happens when you start mixing drugs and you think you can beat it, you think you, you can get high and, and you can live a certain lifestyle and you, and you know, the, the communication's not there, the, the lifestyle's no good and, and you, you end up with disaster at both ends, mother and now daughter. Tom, it's devastating when you lose a parent. I would imagine it's exponentially more devastating when you lose a parent at a young age to suicide. You know, or accidental death. I'm not exactly sure how Whitney's death was officially classified. I look at su the suicide and his suicide by installments. And I firmly believe that I gr I'm a recovering addict. And I grew up with a dad that was out drinking and didn't come home when he should. Now, as a child, I didn't say, oh, my dad suffers from this disease called alcoholism. I said, what's the matter with me? I must be defective. I must not be lovable or my father would be with me. When you grow up with addiction in the family as a young kid I don't care if you're a movie star if you're a billionaire if your IQ is a hundred million it doesn't make a difference a child sees things the same way and when you have parents and addiction the child says what's the matter with me I'm not good enough and what eventually will happen is negative core beliefs develop in that child and when they get old enough they'll act out that negative core belief with addiction, bullying, domestic violence, or they'll act it in with depression, cutting, isolation. So this all happened early on when the child's negative core beliefs are formed. And if they're not able to talk about that or process that already, they're on a destination that is very destructive. So this happened way before. Now, her mom dying triggers it and awakens it. But long before that, she developed, like I did, negative core beliefs that said, I'm not lovable, I'm not good enough. And what we do with those negative core beliefs is we sabotage our lives. We sabotage our intimacy. We sabotage every piece of our life. So this happened way before what you actually saw happened. Dr. Rossi, picking up on what Tom said, how come you'll have two members of the same family one will get all of those negative scripts that Tom talked about, and the other is able to rise above it. Look at Bill Clinton versus Roger Clinton, Jimmy Carter versus Billy Carter. I mean, those are two prime examples, but some people are affected by this and other people are not. That's true, and uh, I am more uh, of a big E guy, environmental factors. I, I think things are learned, and sometimes things are learned in different ways. For example, my father was a smoker. He shouldn't have been a heavy smoker. I kind of rebelled, I just didn't like it. Uh, not that I didn't like my father, he was a great guy, but I think we, we see things in people sometimes and we learn to adapt or go in a different direction. Sometimes we make good choices and we go in, in the right direction or conversely we'll go in the wrong direction because of these core belief systems that are, that are wrong. So I, I think it's, it's based on how the environment, what the factors are that hit you in a certain way that lead you down a certain pathway so you become that person. 
And uh, that's why I think that there's individual differences like this. I don't think a lot of this is based on genes. There's, there's necessarily an alcoholic gene, or there's a gene that someone is going to just happen to get high on Percocet or Vicodin. I think it's more learned. Right. But there also might be a predisposition to be more Could depressed. Be. Could be. Absolutely. Because your brain doesn't produce enough dopamine, for example. Could be. Coach, I'm going to get your uh, take on the Whitney Houston story, a tragedy that the mother dies extremely talented woman but like Tom said step by step she was <coughs> herself. I Excuse saw her in a concert in the early 1990s and she was a mess back then well you know it's a uh, devastating condition please forgive me <coughs> yeah. uh, the depression something that has been studied for quite some time we quite we don't know what triggers it but we know that is there um, it was clearly there in this case both for Whitney uh, I dare to say Bobby as well right and their daughter um, right. fame and fortune doesn't cure it um, in fact some would believe that it adds to the depression because you come to such a high those right. of us that are in the entertainment business understand you get that high of that that show well ev and ev I can tell you as an <coughs> actor everything pales in comparison to performing exactly so you leave there you're way up here exactly. and no matter what you're doing afterwards you're way down here on some level it's relative I mean way down here might be up right. for some people right. might be down yes. for others. and you're only as good as your last show exactly so you're always chasing it. oh yeah then couple that with the drugs and the alcohol it's almost like chasing a, a fix or a high and, and their life was documented of chaos right so it was it wasn't it wasn't too far of a stretch to know that when Whitney had passed away and, and understanding that the daughter was so attached to her they had had her in such the limelight for so long that she was empty if you will she didn't really have a place to go she didn't feel like she had anyone to talk to and um, lots of fingers in that pie Absolutely. as far as could have reached in particularly her father and you know we that's our that's our gist that Bobby could have stepped in a long time ago and, and reached out to his daughter and said listen let me make sure that you're okay particularly after your mother is gone I need to blanket you right I need to get you close to me at all times right. because I know that that's a, a piece missing in your life that will not be filled and unless it's filled um, you could go off the deep end and sad to say she did Thomas you reacting to a lot of this you articulated the problem before what do you see as a solution for somebody like uh, Bobby Christina or somebody at home who's watching this and says you know what I've been drinking too much I've been trying to feel good by artificial means. Well, first of all, you know, the child that comes from addictive parents learns that that's a coping mechanism. It may not be a verbal uh, direct message, but it's an indirect message. I celebrate my good times by drinking and doing drugs. I medicate my problems by drinking and doing drugs. So the child internalizes all this as a coping mechanism. You know, when we think about our childhood and we see mom and dad who are at the top of the pyramid, when they're nurturing each other in a very spiritual, emotional uh, uh, way, we could just be children. When we see there's a problem at the top there, when we see somebody is in pain, a child's response is, I need to fix this situation. I need to either become maybe a people pleaser, maybe a caretaker, or we start to develop these roles very early on in our childhood and carry them through our adult life. So. Uh, the chronological piece here uh, is also important. Are you the first child, second child, third child? But the key solution is, as I'm growing up, is there somebody safe I can talk to? Can I share my feelings with somebody? Can I tell them about my struggles with drugs, my sexual orientation, my curiosity? If a child does not have somebody safe at home to talk to, there's a good shot they're gonna solicit that information from the wrong people, and that's what happens. We start to find people that are incapable of giving us love because in our world, we're sabotaging it. We don't feel we deserve it. So there's a lot of little messages going through the lives of these children, and what basically happens when they get older, they sabotage their lives. They're not gonna find somebody who's able to give them love. They're gonna find somebody that, they, that sabotages the whole situation. Doc, yeah, okay. yeah and I just wanted to follow up on your question because I think it's, what do you do? And I think that just, just as a follow up here, some of the treatment today, I mean, psychologists are great now with cognitive behavioral techniques, there's different counseling approaches, some of the clinics, the clinic that we have has over 500 patients now. We thought 300 would be, would be successful. Why is that? Well, one of the reasons is because we have very good counselors. They use some of the cognitive behavioral uh, techniques or schemes, if you will, 
to deal with some of these issues so mm -hmm. we can confront people and help them change the way they think so mm -hmm. they change their behavior. It works. But if you, if you don't go into treatment, it's, it, it's going to be a downward spiral. So, so, you know, there's so much out there today. I mean, our, our clinic is successful. There are other approaches that are successful. There's 12-step for some other people. There's many different types of approaches today, and, and people can find it, and they should if they have any problems in these areas. Coach, do you think people uh, who are celebrities are more prone to this, or we're just more aware of it because they live public lives? I think the public lives, uh, depression, is prevalent all throughout the community. We know that, rich or poor. Um, in fact, the city of New York has just now announced their new initiative dealing with mental health issues because so many feel the depression. And you know, you feel it in different states. Uh, I might be broke, I'm getting ready to get evicted, my kids are just running crazy. So I feel depressed, I don't want to go anywhere, I don't want to talk to anybody. Well, those are real reasons to be and, depressed. And that seems to be the larger, right. larger pool, if you will. Right. A lot of people are depressed out there, right. they just don't know what depression is. And, and over the last few years, it seems like there's been a good public service announcements. There's been a real push to say, hey, depression is real and it can affect you to the point where you want to kill yourself or kill those around you. Even looking at these kids that come, or, or, I shouldn't say kids, young men or women that go and shoot up a movie theater or go yeah. shoot up a playground because they're depressed. Well, you know, I think for decades we've been saying that TV, violent TV, violent movies and video games do not make anybody more violent. That's been the conventional wisdom. But if you look at these horrific crimes that have happened over the last few decades, they coincide with the rise of violent movies, violent games, and violent TV shows. Do you see any type of correlation or causation there, Doc? Sure. You know, you know think about what the media tries to do. They want to sell you their products all the time. They want to tell you what weight you should be, what friends you should hang out, what food you should eat. They're selling their products. What is that creating in our children? It's, a cre it's creating a society a dissatisfaction. of yeah. better than and less right. than. You're either in or you're out. Creating more bullying, creating more dissatisfaction, more depression. If I'm not this weight or I don't look this way, then I'm not good enough. And yeah, the media feeds into that. And that's why parents need to give their children what the media is taking away. They're good just the way they are, accepted and loved just the way they are. And part of what the media is giving you is that you can solve your problems with a gun. Killing the people around you. I mean, there must be some kind of mass shooter syndrome phenomenon that still needs to be identified out there. Why you have so many yeah. young, middle class, white, disenfranchised young people killing mass numbers of people. I mean, it's beyond gun control. There's something wrong with these individuals and there's some kind of phenomenon taking place here. Well, well, there is. And you have a lot of individuals with what we call a psychologist retained anger. They feel isolated. They're really not part of the community. So they, they, they go from anger or retained anger to rage and then they act out impulsively. So it's a snowball effect. And I, I'm one that really does, I don't like this violence and I don't think it's a good influence at all on TV. However, psychologists have found that for, for, in many cases, people who would tend to be violent anyway because of these factors, they tune into that, they right. seek it out. Right. So, so they're the ones that are watching and they want more of it, you know? Right. So, so it's like a double-edged thing. It's not, it's not any good to begin with and then you have all these other people watching it because that's what they want to watch. So you've got the nuts who are drawn to it yeah. who perhaps right. are fueling their fantasies right. of wide carnage by watching it. Tom, you were gonna say something? Well, you know what? If you grow up in a good childhood, where you're talking about your feelings, sharing your feelings, you can watch video games. You're not gonna go do some of these crazy things, but if you're in a childhood where you feel you're not good enough, where you have a lot of inner anger, where you feel that the world is treating you poorly and you wanna act out with anger, well, the video games are a perfect way to act out the anger. So I gotta reel it in. It all comes down to the messages you receive Let me childhood. get Steven on this. So many Point. families nowadays don't have dads. I think among black families, <coughs> more don't have dads and do have dads that are actively involved in their lives. Um, and, the, you know, it go, cuts across every spectrum, racial, yes. cultural, religious. Is that adding to the depression, adding to the cases of mental illness we see out there? I mean, it, in my view, it does take two effective parents to raise a child. Well, it's definitely a contributing factor when you don't have the father there who is, is giving, leading by example, if you were, showing the way, 
but, by but, not drinking, not smoking, not doing drugs, <coughs> by, by coming home at night, by, yes. by providing the yes. income to the wife if that's needed. Even more. Um, a mm -hmm. lot of the children, and now I, I believe it's been a couple of generations, are being raised on the phone. They're being raised by the video games. That's what the parents have them do. When they come home, they're not going to play ball. They're not going to play the band. They're not going to drama class. They're going home and getting straight on that video. Or, or even worse, they're now on the phone as soon as they come out of school. And that's their life. Mm. And it's very isolated. And it's very you. You, you, you. And, and that doesn't give you a broad spectrum of the world. And when things come crashing down on you, and then they're going to come crashing down. That's mm. life. Couple that. But now you don't have a father in your life who can give you that back. That right. can tell you, don't worry about what all those people are talking right. about you. I love you anyway. Or tell my you, son. Or tell you, stand up straight. That's right. Cut get it the together. nonsense out. That's right. Listen to your mother. That's right. Get or you're home. in big trouble. That's right. I told you to get home after school. Right. Get those chores done. Yeah. Get that homework done. When you don't have that discipline and that yeah. guidance, then you're going to be following the streets and you're going to just follow whichever way the wind blows. And the wind has been blowing for quite some time now that when things come crashing down on you, take everybody out. Doctor, is the availability of prescription antidepressants adding to our problems? I might come from a crazy family, but it seems like everybody is on Zoloft, Prozac, Librium, the like. Well, the answer to that question is big time. Yes, yeah. and <laughs> definitely, and absolutely. <laughs> that would be the answer to that question. And there's no ambivalence here. About and, my crazy family. <laughs> okay. But, but it, it's a real problem. I mean, people get hooked, and they get hooked uh, for legitimate reasons. They go in for pain, whether it's a, a laminectomy, they've got back injury, and they, they start taking Percocet or Vicodin or Oxycontin. That, go, that graduates to heroin, and it, one leads to the other, and it happens to everybody. I mean, it happens to, to people uh, uh, all walks of life. You know, drugs, it, it, it doesn't really relate to color or money. It relates to the person. Right. Oh, yeah. People are doing all kinds of drugs out there. Some are yeah. doing cocaine. Some are doing crack. Some are doubling up on their Prozac. Yeah. But a lot of people out there today are getting high. Okay. We're going to have a whole lot more to talk about after this, including an arms race that is straight out of the movie The Terminator. More on that after this.